my name is Kevin O'Connor. And I'm Kara Clark. And today we are going to take you through the steps of the California Rapid Assessment Method for estuarine wetlands. We're here at the San Francisco Bay at the Don Edwards National Wildlife Refuge. The San Francisco Bay estuary is an extremely important habitat. It's the largest estuary on the West Coast. And during the peak of the spring and fall migrations, over a million birds can be found here. Much of the former tidelands of the San Francisco Bay have been filled through development and the installation of salt ponds. However, efforts underway in the South Bay and in the North Bay are restoring these very important habitats. Thanks for joining us for the training. We hope you enjoy it. The cram module we will be describing to you here is the perennial saline estuarine wetland subtype. This wetland has an obvious dominance of salt tolerant plant species and is perennially open to tidal inputs. This is in contrast to perennial non-saline estuarine wetlands, which are dominated by freshwater plant species, or bar-built estuaries, which are located on the outer coast and have an annual closure of their interaction with the marine environment by a sandbar. When conducting a cram assessment, the first step is to establish your assessment area, or AA. This is the most important step because it will determine all of the physical features and biotic structure that you will be observing when estimating habitat condition. There are several ways to set up your assessment area. The standard method for estuarine wetlands is to set up a one hectare circular AA. However, if you're dealing with a situation with a fringing marsh, you may have a long linear AA. Or if you're assessing a restoration project, your AA will be targeted at the restoration actions. Today, we're gonna to take you through the steps of how to set up a circular assessment area that is about one hectare in size. The first step is to find the center point of your AA using a handheld GPS device. Place a flag at the center point. You will then extend a meter tape, 50 meters in each of the cardinal directions to outline the one hectare circle. When you get to the end of the 50 meter transect, Place a flag at the edge of your assessment area. However, we don't want more than five meters of the transect go into upland area. So if you encounter an upland, you may have to shift your AA in order to make it entirely within the wetland. The Wetlands Association with other aquatic resources is very important for the ecological interactions. In CRAM, we measure this using the aquatic area abundance metric. For estuarine wetlands, use your aerial imagery and draw a transect extending 500 meters from the edge of the assessment area in each of the cardinal directions, north, east, south, and west. Measure the proportion of wetland along each transect. Here at this site, to the north, the estuarine wetland continues until it hits the housing development. To the north, we have 31% wetland. To the south, the wetland is interrupted by a road, and we have 93% wetland. To the east, we have 100% wetland. And to the west, we are interrupted by another road, and we have 89% wetland. The average percentage wetland at this site is 78%. This gives us an A for this metric. Use your aerial image to determine the percentage of your AA that has buffer. To do this, draw your AA on your aerial, and look along the perimeter of that AA for areas with non-buffer land cover type that are at least five meters long. Outline those areas so you know where buffer is not present. Then take all the areas where buffer is present and refer to the rating table in your field book for the appropriate scoring. To measure the buffer width in estuarine wetlands, draw eight lines extending from the edge of the AA out to 250 meters or where a non-buffer land cover is encountered. Distribute the eight lines evenly around the edge of the AA where buffer is present. So if a part of the AA does not have buffer, do not draw the lines measuring buffer in that area. Measure the width of each line and average them to get the average buffer width. Use the table to determine a score for buffer width. At this site, the buffer is in the range of 190 to 250 meters, so it gets an A. I'm taking a walk through my buffer to get an estimate of its condition. Here we see extensive amounts of non-native grasses, some mustard, and a eucalyptus tree. We also have some plants from the urban environment. However, 
This area, combined with large amounts of marsh that are con constituting part of the buffer, leads me to give this site a score of B. That's because there's a mix of natives and non-natives, not a lot of human visitation, and not much soil disturbance. Natural sources of fresh water for estuarine wetlands can include precipitation, groundwater, or riverine flows. Other anthropogenic sources can be from storm drains or irrigation runoff from agriculture. To score this metric, look at the aerial imagery for the site. Assess the water sources within about two kilometers upstream of your assessment area. Measure how much of this area is covered by land covers such as urban or agricultural land use. The proportion of urban or ag land use will determine the scoring for this metric. Here at this site, the surrounding landscape has more than 20% of the surrounding region covered by urban land use. Therefore, it gets a C score. The hydroperiod metric measures the frequency and duration of inundation in a wetland. In estuarine wetlands, this is caused by tidal exchange. Here at this wetland, we have culverts and tide gates under the road grade, which mute the tidal action into our assessment area. The tide gates are mostly closed and are not actively managed. So they allow water to come in and out. However, it is somewhat muted. According to the narrative table for this metric, we would assign a score of a B. The hydrologic connectivity metric describes the ability of water to flow into and out of the wetland. In estuarine wetlands, this is measured by looking at the degree of restriction by unnatural features, such as levees, dikes, or road grades. Here we have an example of a road grade, which is restricting the movement of floodwaters along this edge of the wetland. To assess the metric, we look at the perimeter of the wetland that contains our AA and measure the degree of unnatural restrictions. In small estuarine wetlands, you may be able to include the entire wetland in your view. However, in very large wetlands, we cannot assess the entire area, so we restrict the view for this metric to within 500 meters of our assessment area. Here at this marsh, there are levees or road grades that surround the entire marsh. Therefore, it gets a D for this metric. When assessing the physical patch type metric, you'll want to walk throughout your entire AA and look for examples of the physical patches listed in your field book. You want them to be at least three meters square in size. And in salt marshes, you want to do this at low tide so that all of the physical features are exposed. Once you've walked throughout your entire AA, add up all of the patches that were observed and refer to the scoring table in your field book for the appropriate score. Undercut banks, such as you see here, occur along the edges of channels in tidal marshes. These features can serve as habitat and refugia for small fishes and invertebrates. Filamentous macroalgae and algal mats can be found in estuarine wetlands. This macroalgae occurs on benthic sediments or on the water surface. It's an important primary producer and is the base of the food web in many wetlands. Algal mats can provide habitat for macroinvertebrates and fishes in estuarine wetlands. A flat is a non-vegetated area of silt, sand, clay, gravel, cobble, or shell hash, or it can be a mix of substrates. In estuarine wetlands, they're often called mud flats. This is a nice example behind me, a broad open area adjoining the wetland foreshore. This flat provides habitat for shorebirds, wading birds, or other aquatic birds. It can also provide habitat when the tide is high, for fishes and macroinvertebrates. A pan or pool on the floodplain is a depression which may have ponded water or it may be dry at other parts of the year. These are important habitats for migrating waterfowl. To find pans or pools in your assessment area, you must thoroughly walk the entire area. However, they may also be visible on aerial imagery. Hummocks are mounds created by plants along the marsh plain or the shorelines of estuarine wetlands. Sediment that is brought by flood flows accumulates at the base of the plants. This makes hummocky topography, which provides a moisture niche for various plant species. Here we have an example of a small point bar at the confluence of these two channels. These features can be much larger in larger systems. It's covered in a diatom sheen and is serving as habitat for small insects and invertebrates. 
Pools, which are deeper portions of the channel, are very important habitat. This is because, as opposed to other parts in the channel that dewater, these parts retain water throughout the tidal cycle. This is essential for fishes and invertebrates that need water all the time. Salt marshes have channels which convey tidal flows into and out of the marsh. Here we have the main channel, and off to my left a secondary channel, which adds additional physical complexity to the marsh habitat. Here at Mayhew's Landing, we walked our entire AA and gave it a score of B based on the number of patch types we observed. When assessing topographic complexity in salt marshes, you'll want to walk two representative transects within your AA and record all the micro and macro topographic features in your worksheet as a sketch. You'll then compare those two sketches to figure eight in your field book for the appropriate scoring. I'm now going to take you through an example transect here at this marsh and describe all the physical features that I'm seeing. Start off with a pan here on the floodplain, now descending down into a small depression and rising up onto a natural levee. Here we have a small first order tidal channel. I'm coming up over another natural levee here and dropping down into an area with several hummocky features. As I continue to walk, this area is relatively flat. However, in this area, I come up to the main tidal channel with undercut banks. After doing several sketches at this site, we decided to give it a score of B. The plant community metric is composed of three submetrics, the number of plant layers, the number of codominant species, and the percent invasion. To assess this metric, you must thoroughly walk the entire assessment area to observe all of the plant species present. There's a worksheet which you will fill out outlining the plant species that are the codominants in the assessment area. This will allow you to score all three of the submetrics. When conducting the CRAM assessment, we only look at vascular species, so we do not include mosses and algae in this metric. In estuarine wetlands, the plant community is low to the ground. Therefore, the plant heights are somewhat shorter than other wetland modules. The short layer is less than 0.3 meters. Here we have saltgrass, pickleweed, and jaumea in the short layer. The medium layer is 0.3 meters to 0.75 meters. In the medium layer, we have pickleweed and grandelia. Behind me, we have a tall layer, this mustard plant, which is between 0.75 meters and 1.5 meters. If you have a plant that is last year's annual growth and has senesced, you can still count that layer as present. However, you only count the species in the species list if you have live plants of that species present. Here at this site, we have three plant layers, so we get a B for this submetric. To assess the number of codominant species, look at each layer and determine which species are at least 10% of that layer. Here at this site, we have pickleweed, saltgrass, and jamea in the short layer. In the medium layer, we have pickleweed and grandelia. This brings up an important point, which is that a single species can be found in more than one layer. However, an individual plant can only be counted in a single layer. At the site, we also have a tall layer. The only species in the tall layer is invasive mustard. We have a total of five species, which gives us an A for this submetric. The percent invasion metric characterizes the presence of invasive plants in the assessment area. The invasive status is based on the list generated by the California Invasive Plant Council. Here at this site, we have one invasive species, this mustard. To calculate this metric, you divide the number of codominant invasive species by the total number of codominants. So here we have one invasive species out of five total, which gives us 20% invasion. This makes a B for this submetric. Assessing horizontal interspersion in salt marsh habitats can be slightly more difficult than other wetland types due to the compressed nature of the biotic structure. However, small changes in moisture gradients and elevation can have large effects on the associated plant community. Please be sure to walk throughout your entire assessment area when conducting this metric. At Mayhew's Landing, we have several plant zones. Here you can see a saltgrass zone, 
with pickleweed along the channel and on this island. As we continue to pan, you can see a zone of grandilia along the channel with mustard in the upland background. Here is a plant zone of sedges adjacent to the main channel. You can see coming up through the bottom, new growth under the senescent last year's growth. When assessing vertical biotic structure in salt marsh habitats, you'll want to walk your entire assessment area and look for areas that support a dense canopy of living vegetation, entrainment, or detritus that's at least 10 to 20 centimeters off the marsh plain surface. Here you can see a very nice example of a dense canopy of living vegetation over the marsh plain surface with about 10 to 20 centimeters of space, allowing for habitat for wildlife. That wildlife may include the salt marsh harvest mouse or the clapper rail. Here at Mayhers Landing, habitat like this exists for more than 50% of the assessment area, so we gave it a score of A. We hope you've enjoyed the training. We'd like to extend our thanks to Eric Maruz and Cheryl Strong at the Don Edwards National Wildlife Refuge. For more information, please see our website.